You're listening to the Decentered Media Podcast with me, Rob Watson. Conversations about community media. Visit decentered.co.uk or follow on Instagram and Twitter at Decentered Media. Hello, uh, Rob Watson here with Decentered Media, and I'm working on an approach over the next couple of editions of the podcast to start to look at how community media can serve as a form of community sense making. So the idea is that we uh, have kind of few opportunities in our mass media society for us to get involved directly and create and nurture our own um, centers of meaning, uh, meaning institutions. These are the kind of phrases that are used in this. It comes out of the meta-modern uh, argument and discussion. And so in the, in the next couple of episodes, I'm going to be exploring with different people uh, what community sense making means, what it's about, how do we define ourselves, how do we make sense of ourselves, and how do we use our media to do that as well. So today I'm really pleased to be joined to start this uh, with Kamala Patney, who is the director and founder of COS, Celebrate Our Similarities, which is a CIC that's based here in Leicester, and it has, well, I'll let you introduce it. Uh, how, how does it... How would you define cause? Good morning, Rob. Thank you for inviting me. I feel honoured that you're starting off with me uh, on this new theme. Um, so, I'm Kamala Patney. Um, celebrate our similarities, and we generally call it cause, C-O-S, cause, and it's getting to be known that way, which is quite good, easy, is a community interest company um, that I founded back in 2010, but didn't actually structure it because in those days, my personal sort of um, focus has always been on personal peace, uh, which is something my mom had um, instilled in me in a way from a young age. And having witnessed what I witnessed at growing up in um, Africa, which is where I was born, um, we had a wider view of inequalities, you know, that kind of thing in, in, in around the world. And I guess <clears throat> that's where it all started for me, um, to, to see what, how the world works and how it doesn't work and how you can try in your little way to make it work for you. That's all you can do. You can't change the world. I understand that but if we don't try we can never achieve so celebrate our similarities community interest company a not-for-profit um, we are about identifying good practice examples under two themes um, personal peace as I said and climate underneath that we recognize you know what does make us all humans you know we all have very similar um, sort of priorities and needs throughout time so we can say oh you are like this or I'm like this or whatever but ultimately when you look at the bigger picture throughout time everybody's purpose in life generally has a very similar approach and I'm not saying what it is I'm just saying that you can see in history um, so underneath those two themes we focus on air, food, water, good sleep, mental health, well-being, climate in general, and um, equality. Um, all of these things make us contented in life, if we have the right measure of them. Um, and throughout my life, in, in my working life, and in sort of cultural norms and all of that, I've noticed a disparity in so many ways. And I always felt, how do you address that? And for me, from a young age, I learned about personal peace. And it's not, it's not a theory. It really isn't a theory. It is 
more practical than we can even appreciate on a daily basis. It's, it, it's quite shocking if, if, when you do get connected with yourself. It, it, it can be shocking. And that's how powerful it is. And I look around and think people are focusing on differences and trying to big themselves up against another. For what, at the end of the day? And... Uh, Just to let people know, we didn't realise we'd be past that. So we're on, on the De Montfort University campus and we're just parked by the... Uh, it turns out we're, we're right next to a toilet, so it's part of the... Uh, exactly, the, the, the we're alive. Yeah. Yeah, we're alive, Yeah, we're folks. alive, yeah. And yeah. we are alive. So, 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 so one of the things, I mean, that, that's a really gr- you know, great encapsulation of a personal ethos, uh, I think, and what I'd like to explore is kind of how you got to that point, what contributed to this view that you've now got about that that kind of importance of a sense of personal and social peace, and then also what the, you know, maybe think about what the challenges are in, you know, this, because you're very much rooted in, in experience in Leicester and as a super diverse city, how you've uh, worked with other people across different cultural traditions and faith traditions to bring people together. So just tell us a bit about your backstory, if you like, of, of you know, what, what, what's driven you to set cause up and to uh, try and do the things that you're, you know, that, that you're, you're attempting to do now. Um. Right, so you say my um, focus on my, I'm, I'm completely rooted in Leicester. I, I actually lived for 15 years in Carlisle, up north, quite a different culture completely. And in fact, just as a side, when I went there in 1990, uh, end of 89, 90, um, I didn't see a non-white person for six months, uh, apart from my now ex-husband, but, you know... Um, and people used to do double takes every single day looking at me and they wouldn't smile. I mean, that's really stressful. Um, and it's an experience I'll never forget. Um, but I mean, things have changed, so, you know, but, but that, that's the reality that I have experienced. And everything shapes you. I think your experiences shape you and your understanding of what people are thinking. Uh, impacts the way you work, you make your decisions, you make your choices and, and whatever. So bringing it back to Leicester then, um, again, having worked in um, social housing for many, many years, um, I've seen the disparity in people's needs and the services being provided. Um, not because they're uh, being deliberately uh, sort of held back. It's just the nature of things in some ways, but also I've noticed that, you know, in Leicester, for example, uh, <clears throat> when you talk about service delivery, how in the 70s and 80s, when the... Um, migrants came in, my family came here and many others um, were very insular so any problems they had they dealt with it within the community they, for example they didn't they, they looked down on having council housing for example they looked down on taking housing benefits and as you probably have heard, Asians tend to be business people they, you know set up their own ways of earning an income and that kind of thing. And in that process, the um, services that were being developed, you know, it was still, you know, relatively early days for um, local authority services to be developed uh, for the people. And because of the way that they were being developed and the lack of communication, between those communities and the authorities, not lack of communication, but just by nature, people just dealt with their thing. 
um, the service has been developed without their input. So therefore, the services are not geared up towards the needs of particular groups that didn't engage. And those that did engage and, and demanded, the services were geared up towards their needs. So I'm going to say something a little bit controversial. And I say, the f it's particularly since COVID, when you look at the fact that now, since the 2021 census, um, we've got 59% BAME population in Leicester City. And yet that group, BAME people, are underrepresented. How does that happen? There is a disparity. There is a concerted, or perhaps maybe not concerted or very visible way, but there is a particular method of working that is of disbenefit to some groups. And people like myself have watched this happen. So we've tried to do things. So for example, I can say from you know, my personal point of view that you know, even when I was up north, promotions were never coming our way when you were delivering 100%, and yet somebody that didn't manages to. So that impacts your view of things, and therefore your trust or distrust or whatever develops in that way. And your, all your choices are based subconsciously or consciously towards maneuvering your way in life through all of those things with an expectation that, oh, well, I won't even go for that job because I know it's not going to happen. So this is how things become solid. You almost self-edit beforehand. That's not the kind of job that I could thrive in. Um, and that's not the kind of role that I could take on. And, and there's sometimes there's a reverse pressure from... Uh, cultural expectations about it's acceptable from um, for, for for some families to wish their offspring to go in, into certain professions business law medicine and not into arts social studies or you know so the, it's it's kind of which you know and how so so the the, the scaffolding isn't there? But that's after. A, I mean, the, the, the you know, we, we've, Leicester's been a multicultural city for a long time. Um, so, what what is there something about the approach to, in your experience, the approach to multiculturalism that is actually does it work? Is it is it suited to the needs of people in? and across different communities or people from different back. I don't, I don't like using the word community in this kind of offhand way of saying you know, the communities and there's lots of communities in Leicester. It's people who identify with certain and f become certain communities. So it's never as easy as just to label people as, you, you know, your faith means that you are a member automatically of that community. That would be presumptuous. It can be and it largely is, but I wouldn't want to presume that as well. So the language is kind of interesting about how we use it but what do you think that's that's been that that uh, hesitancy or that inability to get in to the system what is is that um self-edited and restrained from people because that's the worst form of inequality the inequality that you impose on yourself because you don't feel as if you can take part or you're the kind of person that can take part in something um what would we you know what's your experience of well yeah i mean what i would add to what i just said before is that that was in the 70s and 80s people have changed so the the people of that time had probably get, got set in their ways it, it was much clearer now, wasn't it yes, distinct they were, that's it, right it was black and white yeah now yeah. it's it's it it's, has moved on yeah. and it's it, it's varied yeah. And so the younger people, so, so for example, those people, those individuals, my kind of age range, um, you know, my, my parents' age range, really, who are now obviously, uh, you know, decreasing in numbers, but then my age range um, are 
uh, more proactive in getting involved and looking at things in different ways away from the culture as well. So talking about families wanting you to go in a certain direction professionally or whatever, as a woman, you didn't have that. So it was like whatever job you get, it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, you'll be in the home. You know, that was the, the base. But we've, we've, you know, as individuals, we've really changed things. I feel quite proud that, you know, we've found our way in life in a way that within the constraints of disparity, we've still managed to become independent people where we need to and being able to support our families. You know, I'm a divorcee. I feel comfortable in, uh, you know, life in the sense that I've managed to become independent financially regardless and ha you bring up two young kids or now grown up and whatever um, yeah the cost of living is an issue now for everyone that's not you know nobody's uh, immune to that um, so the so your question about what makes the communities I think I think Leicester's amazing in the way that we do work together but with the volume of different communities comes different issues different responsibilities if you want to call it and that is about actually engaging between like you say intercultural um, cohesion and I think that is lacking it's my view I'm not sure whether everybody would agree with that I think they would generally but my view is is that <clears throat> you know you've got the Indian communities in the Belgrave area, the West Indian communities in maybe Highfields, Muslim communities in Highfields, and uh, you've got Somalis in St Matthews. You know, you've got generalised areas, and they don't necessarily mingle as much. And in a way, Cos would like to help that process, you know, because. Again, coming back to what celebrating our similarities is about, it's actually recognizing how uh, we can recognize that we all have the same, same ways of living, same, same wants and same needs. And particularly now with the, the idea of um, climate, and peace, actually, you know, with since COVID, I mean, there's two elements of peace now. There's, there's a war and peace kind of peace, as well as uh, mental well-being. And in cause, we like to call mental wealth. We like to think that we've actually got a muscle of mental health, and the wealth is developed by the muscle that you build of that mental health when your muscle is lacking in substance it's your mental weakness or mental health issues or whatever however you want to phrase it so your mental wealth is achieved through your satisfaction in life in general of you know being contented having your basics you know the Maslow theory of relativity and all of that um, so that's what we want to get all the different communities to actually recognize and so so I should have really said it in the beginning celebrate our similarities is independent of politics religion culture uh, commercial interest um, any other isms and X or whatever, politics and whatever. Um, but we do respect all of them because the reality of life is that you have to be able to make change happen by knowing how it all works. It doesn't mean that you have to be party to it or n separate from it, within it, but in a way that is human. And humanity, when you distill everything down, humanity is a very kind state of being. And we've forgotten that because we've created structures that are just so complicated. 
And we think we've used our intelligence to create such complex ways of living. You know, <laughs> look at the um, news right now about the housing market. You know, the talk. How can the housing market mean that a person at the bottom of the scale uses up 50% of their income on housing, whereas somebody right at the top, less than half a percent? That's not clever. That's, that's greed. That, you know, the structures that we've built are based on the wrong principles, and, and unraveling that is a huge issue. And people might say that it's utopic. It's not because the facts and the report card is coming in now because the way we've been living, the earth is now talking. You know, that is where we are. And we have to wake up to actually changing the way we live, it's fundamentally changing the way we live. You know, I, sometimes when we talk about, you know, luxury, Actually, the earth isn't meant for us to all live in luxury. It's just basic. But actually having the right, um, right recognition of what living a contented life is, that should have been the basis on which the structures were built. And now we can. We can bring it back. And I think people are realizing that, but they're not there yet. So having said all of that, um, you know, we're, we're, we're coming from the angle of, of respecting politics and religion and faiths and, and, and uh, commercial interests as well, where it helps us bring people together. Um, and I can't remember what you were originally well, asking. They, they, no, no, it was fascinating. And there's a couple of things that you prompted me to think through, which is the... First of all, I think the you know the, the the challenge we are living. I mean, one of the problems I have with some of the the way that um, difference and diversity is expressed in Leicester is that it's as if it's automatically okay, and that just because we have diversity, it doesn't recognise. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? It doesn't recognise exploitation. And there are many instances of, we, we saw this through the pandemic with the uh, the factories, the, the sweatshops, is that you can, yeah, okay, you can be inclusive by bringing people in from around the world and doing things in languages that respect cultural traditions, but you're paying somebody peanuts and, and you're exploiting them. So that that isn't a moral, you know, diversity in itself isn't a moral virtue. Um, it's only a moral virtue when it shows respect and compliance with standards and norms. Um, but we, we live in a world which is very difficult. You know, I think the, the, the way that we live our lives, it's very difficult to find a secure footing. And we, don't, we lack those, what we, we call the kind of sense-making institutions because we're driven by shopping, you know, you, you, I mean, a city like Leicester, like the vast majority of cities in the UK, you go anywhere and it's full of chain stores. You know, art galleries struggle to survive. Community theatres struggle to survive. It's mass market stuff. It's homogenised. It's the set. There's no point in travelling around the UK because the shops are all the same in every town and city. And what gives somewhere its unique identity and what enables people to feel that they belong and have a common sense of a common culture and a common life together that still respects the where people come from but enables something for people to come together to move forward together uh, and i think we I, I my personal experience of this is that we don't have that and that it's naive of people to just gloss over it and say oh it's all wonderful We've got this, and we've got this, and we've got this. We've got Diwali, we've got Caribbean Carnival, we've got King Richard, we've got the football, and it's like, that's not enough in, in my expectation. Um, how, how, now the, the challenge is, now what, what I think, the reason why I wanted to chat with you about this is because actually I think you've, wh whether it's success, success is, um, <laughs> is, is one step at a time and relative, but you put on an event a few weeks ago at the Wesley Hall, where you brought a whole range of people together uh, from, and it was, it really was one of the most uh, 
diverse and inclusive events I've attended for a long time uh, in Leicester. Uh, and, and maybe that's my... I don't get out as much as I should do. I'm happy to admit that. However, I thought it was it was great. Can you tell us a bit about how that came about and describe a bit of what it was like and who was there and what the interaction and dynamic was like? And what did you think about when you were putting that together as being what the need was? Uh, yeah, it is. It was probably, I agree with you, the most diverse uh, event I've been to as well. And I, I feel really pleased in the way that it turned out as well. Um, so we had, um, you know, we had a range of organisations supporting us, um, including the De Montfort University, which is where we are talking today, uh, Leicester City Council, um, Leicestershire Cares, um, Reaching People, NHS, um, National Asso uh, Academy for Social Prescribing, um, and probably about 50 organisations, and then individuals on top of that. So um, I would say that this has been de in development, put it this way, cause in its development has never expected results. What we're saying is, I mean, for me, for me, it's, it's just the joy of just talking to people and actually connecting with them through our similarities. And what I find, which is quite magical, is that people that I didn't expect to be able to communicate at that level with just open up and they just... And, and this is where the connections have become solid. So my conversations over the years have been with individuals who wow. then saw the value in what we were doing. And yeah, I go on and on about cause, of course, but you have to, because otherwise how do people know? And luckily I've not exhausted myself <laughs> in, uh, you know, talking about it. But, but what I know, actually, what I know about what cause wants to do is unique and it is essential. It is, it, it is, it has the potential to <clears throat> bring about dividends for Leicester, put it this way. You know, if we're talking in the structures that we work in, COS has the ability, and I know it, and this is why it keeps me going, that I believe that COS, if the leaders get behind and understand what we're talking about, that in terms of everything that we're trying to achieve as uh, society is potentially achievable not only from a human level but also from a city's development level or a county's development level I think as a county we should be looking at, at the bigger picture in that sense um, so bringing it back to how it came about um, I'm also involved in a number of like voluntary roles because I've been and I feel lucky and I, I do feel very lucky to be in the position to be able to do this is that um, I've engaged with areas that I feel passionately about and volunteered my role so I'm um, on the regional advisory board for the Canals and Rivers Trust uh, who now happen to be I mean these are the coincidences that make me more excited is that the Canals and Rivers Trust has a particular focus in Leicester on a national level um, so that brings about all the benefits potentially for us um, I know that the City Council's priorities are in developing the waterside and the Woolsey Island so that, that's another connection there um, I've volunteered to go on the uh, Better Mental Health NHS um, Mental Health Collaborative. Um, it's like a, it's a side arm of the new ICB uh, Integrated Care Board. Uh, it's focusing on mental health, and there has been discussion. Or I heard something. I mean, I'm I'm just a. Uh, 
representing the voluntary sector for the Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland uh, overall area. Um, and um, I've also volunteered to be a community ambassador for the National Academy for Social Prescribing. And they, they are focusing in here in Leicester as well. And all of these issues are very related. So for me, getting involved in those areas and then connecting them up with what COS wants to do and then the icing on the cake for me is the fact that the De Montfort Uni, which is my old uni before it became DMU, I, I studied at, at uh, Leicester Polytechnic, which is now the De Montfort Uni. So I have a connection with that on a personal level, but then for it to be the international hub for Goal 16, SDG 16, Peace, Justice and Strong Institutions. Not only are the SDGs have become so prominent, particularly in the last three or four years, because who knew about SDGs five years ago? They didn't, um, I didn't, you know, hardly. Um, not only are they sort of very prevalent, but the Peace, Justice and Strong Institutions, as the um, the head of the UN, um, Antonio Guterres, said uh, in Cornwall in 2021, he said that Goal 16, Peace, Justice and Strong Institutions, is the most important one of the 17 goals, without which you cannot even dream of achieving the rest. If you've got that, you've got everything. And that's the biggest task, so it's the biggest one. But the De Montfort is the only university in the UK to have this international hub status. And the first time in history to have this particular goal. And it's the goal of our time, isn't it? You know, when you look at it. And so those are the unique things that are available to Leicester that excites me. So. When I speak to people, they can see the value in just supporting that as well. But then when I've been able to luckily um, bring the right organizations to, to the right people. So for example, on that event, we had you know, all the key uh, major authorities giving an update on the current situation that they're in. And post-COVID, everybody wants to know where everything is, how is everything's working. And then connecting them up with the organizations that are leading groups, you know, the, the leaders within voluntary sector organizations who are looking for ways of connecting up with the agencies and how they can provide their services to their uh, communities then this became a natural kind of a positive thing. But also, like you were saying, that um, although it was very diverse, um, and there were, the majority were women, now I'd like to address that point, that one, it is, n it is n well, I make no apology, put it this way, I make no apology for the fact that the people there represented a lot of me because I've watched this wherever I've gone where I'm the only person uh, of, of, you know, a non-white. In Carlisle, I didn't see anyone. For 15 years, I worked there. In my profession in housing, I never came across a non-white person there. So I've had the experience of that. So it just naturally means that the people that you engage with or you have a focus with tend to be from, and they relate more to you. But this time we've been able to bring the agencies. So again, if you look at it, the, most of the males that were there were either collaborators, speakers, or significant elements. Most of the women that were there were participants, attendees, that kind of thing. 
Um, that's not to say that they were all the same, but, you know, just to <laughs> qualify that. Um, but, it, yeah, it, I mean, ultimately what I would say is it's hard work. It's hard work. One of the things you said earlier, and you just re- echoed it again a, a moment ago, was that um, that inability of people to look you in the eye. How have you learned to look at so because that is a you know let's be honest dealing with people from different cultures ha- is a learnt experience because we are to use a better phrase tribal and we tend to it's easy for us to group together and that's may, some people might argue that that's the natural way of doing things and i, I, I don't agree with that but it's it's it, you know, we, we learn to, we wouldn't be a society we wouldn't have civilizations if we didn't engage with each other but we have to learn to look at each other in the eye and have empathy and understand where we're coming from and what the framework is that uh, informs us when we meet. How, how have you learned that? So you talked to, you had, well, there must have been, I don't know, as an, a, a rule of thumb, I'd say there were about 30 different people from 30 different faiths ethnicities, nationalities, types of organization in that room. How do, you, how do you approach and what would you say to somebody who's maybe has less opportunities? Because you come to Leicester, you've got to learn very quickly to deal with people from different cultural backgrounds. It's a global city and that's a, a potentially a real strength if it's used properly. But how do you learn that? What would you recommend to somebody is to say, say well, look, I had to, you had to learn the hard way by living through this. But what would you put, want to see put in place that would help from people to, to learn that without having to go through the, the hard work that you've had to go through? <laughs> you won't believe it if I said this to you, but that is the truth. Peace education. Peace education is what I was talking about there. And this is the basis of my enthusiasm in cause and all of all of this is that once you are in connection with the your own existence all of those differences just wash away they can wash away that's not but, to but say they, but they don't for, we can't be naive about that no, can we? because no. some people don't want to give that up they, 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 those oh, yeah. barriers, I, those, the, 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 you know, the, the, the armor that people oh, hold with them is there. Is that's where their protection and their security comes oh, from? Oh, I can tell you a story just of last week. I'll tell you in a little minute, uh, uh, and I'm not breaking any confidences there, but that's a real eye opener. I'll tell you in a moment. But you say it's uh, we can't be naive, and I reiterate that people think it's utopic uh, to think in those terms. But actually, if we accept that our structures have been wrong in the first place, and we've been developing them, so you know we talk about progress. Progress for what? We talk about progress for our future generations. But actually, what have we done? Our future generation's future is at stake as a result of our methods of progress. So what would, you, what would you say those structures have been that have kept us back? And what would you say were the structures that we need to invest in? So, uh, okay, so, so uh, I mean, I'm not being political here. Uh, so I'm being, trying to stay human. Pragmatic, so, yeah, general. Pragma- general, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm just saying that, you know, t- talking about creating structures that say um, <clears throat> profits is the bottom line. And you, if you don't do that, you're not, you're not realistic enough. That's wrong. So is um, saying from the other scale, other side of the scale, um, to say that we all have to work on the same basis. So theory of open markets to Marxism or you know whatever you want to call it anything that's dogmatic about those things those two ideas they they are not what humanity is about and nature you can see nature nature destructs nature is violent but nature is very 
beautiful at the same time as gentle and there is a magic about it and we we are here for a blink of an eye and we seem to take over and think that we are the for what you know however much you may own whatever you own trillions or two pence ultimately you'll go without even that two pence never mind the trillions you know if we can accept that our whole thinking changes that it's only temporary and how can we make it better for our future generations in a more human way and that changes your thinking so what would you like to see people or, or you know, always be able to invest to facilitate that greater sense of understanding yeah. So, so first, understand yourself and work from that outwards. Um, kindness, empathy, you know, contentment, choice, all of those lovely things, they are not just words and they are not just sentiments. They are powerful tools that we have buried by building the structures that we've built. And now we have to undo that. And yeah, of course, that is the hard bit. If you create a bad habit, it's harder to undo it. But if you just didn't get that habit in the first place, it's not an issue. It, it, a, 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 maybe not a very good analogy, but it, it comes to my mind, is the, the kind of, I would describe it sometimes as zealotry that comes with football. And people, my, my family are like this. They're all Evertonians. And my sister is vociferously uh, has a kind of almost a hatred towards uh, Liverpoolians. And, um, and that's replicated many, you know, and it's like, I'm not interested in football. So, you know, I, I, I don't see the need to have strong views and opinions about a tribal association with a football team because it seems to me to be a complete waste of energy they're all playing different people win at different times it doesn't doesn't have any a law for me but other people invest so much in that identification with their team and the the trials and tribulations of how, the intricacies of how it goes up and down and all that kind of stuff and we've seen it here in Leicester with with, with Leicester City and it's had good times and bad times and and it's like a, a proxy, it's something else. That's one of our sense-making institutions that gives people an opportunity to project themselves into their identification with their club. And often we do that with our faith organisations. It's, it's, it's a way of projecting into ourselves something that we identify with, which if it takes over to the point of dogmatism and extremism, you forget that you've actually got to be able to also interact with lots of other people as well and that common ground because otherwise we're all just held off so you know you, know, you could imagine a, 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 a overarching you have the England or the Scotland or the Wales matches which brings all of those football fans together and they're not sat in this is want the Liverpool end and this is the Leicester City end and this is the Manchester United group they're, they're intermixed because there's an overarching um, identification with the with you know so you know, with, with, how, how's your experience I mean that's, I don't know about that as an analogy <coughs> no no <laughs> I, I like that I like it yeah. because yeah yeah because in fact <clears throat> doesn't that tell us that that we as human beings are vulnerable to become dogmatic and that dogma dogmatism isn't our natural position it tells us very clearly that okay I'm you know kicking a football <laughs> around a field would be if I was to say that to somebody that's really into football would get very offended yeah now in every aspect of life we can create that and we can lose our humanity in the process. If we can relate to that, it can be... So I'll give you an example. When I was in Carlisle, it was the first time ever, uh, I believe, I don't know for sure, but it, it felt like it anyway, that there was a, a cricket match between England and India. And as I mentioned before, I was the only non-white person there. 
And in the, an open plan office, the tension that was created so much that I couldn't sleep at night. And guess what? I don't even know what cricket is. I never understood. I still don't understand how it works. And I refuse now to understand it, to be honest, <laughs> on principle. But the pressure that I was put under to say, which side do you take? But does that put you in a position then that you have to be an outsider? And that you don't have a strong identification with, 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 with one of the in-groups? Because they, that bonding that, that is formed around that identification with a national team or with a, a community very powerful and it creates you know it kind of it, it allows us to come together to form something which can be purposeful and be used for a, a purpose good or bad and um you know but you're kind of slightly detached from that in a way aren't you and you're seeing across these things so you you were in the, using the sporting analogy you'd use gymnastics football cricket rugby you're not really particularly i'm assuming that you're not particularly interested in i'm not particularly interested in sports so i can look pragmatically across them and say well there's a thread that runs across them which connects people which people in the individual um those who are associated just with football or just with rugby maybe can't see until they step back yeah yeah i mean i think that is that does happen then you bring it back to equality on, from that sort of analogy to the equality. I'll give you the example I was talking about last week. You will not believe this happened. So I went to this event I was invited to. Um, I won't say what it was or anything. Um, and as it turned out, again, I felt like I was in Carlisle actually at that point because I was the only Asian woman there. Um, and I mentioned that to the person that had invited me there. And uh, they said, oh, yeah, I never looked at it that way. You're right, there's no representation here. Um, anyway, I was a guest there. So to cut a very long story short, came into a situation where somebody was asked a, a question about what they're doing now that they're retired or whatever and they had applied for a, a post in a, some authoritative position and uh, they said oh you know I didn't get it do you know why because I failed on my diversity question and uh, the person wasn't asking them anymore I was stood there with my plate of food waiting to go to the table and uh, they this was a conversation for of about probably six to seven minutes it's a long time um and they said i when they asked me about the diversity question i said the word p now, I don't know if I'm allowed to say the word. I won't say it, but, you know. You're called. You, you, you. Yeah, so, so they said Paki. So it's in an interview for an authoritative job. And they said that the, what they were trying to say to the interviewers <laughs> was that not everybody gets offended by that word. And yet they're not in that category. So they <laughs> didn't have the self-awareness. No, absolutely not. And so I wasn't... So, so this is... Look at it from... Forget about their viewpoint, right? This is me standing there. Yeah. And they're ignoring that I'm there. Yeah. And they're saying this to this other person. Yeah. And they're saying, um, I didn't get it because I, I was trying you, to tell... They used this particular word and they couldn't yeah. understand why that word was not... Uh, appropriate yeah they couldn't understand it but they were just saying that no i wanted them to understand my point of view that not everyone gets offended by that and why they didn't give me the job at the end of the day she was offend they were offended um anyway it because they knew what they were doing i could tell because i've had a lot of experience plenty of experience of of innuendos and all of this kind of stuff I wouldn't react 
it so, was like they so, were, it was like they were goading you. Yeah, 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 definitely. But they, but they they thought I didn't get it, so they spoke louder, and then it got worse. They said, "Would you believe this?" And this is last week. <clears throat> they said, "Oh, and they're trying to change the history books now, aren't they?" And um, um, I don't know w what they're thinking. Well, <clears throat> that's not, that's just not on. <clears throat> and the other person was trying to change the subject, so badly I felt sorry for them. <laughs> anyway, they apologized and whatever. And you know what? I know this is going to sound really odd, but the person was just so apologetic and I felt so sorry for them. And it's n not an issue, but what I was trying to say was that this is very prevalent. I have seen it. And, and it's on the increase, you know, recently as well. And we need to actually nip it in the bud. Yeah, I could have raised the issue directly with them, but what would that what would that have achieved? The you know, but um, but I wasn't going to give them satisfaction of even being, and I wasn't actually. It's it's water over duck's back for me because it's their problem, and so I decided to describe. So the person was saying, I'm going to talk to them later on. I said, you don't have to, you know. She says, no, I want it for myself because I'm really annoyed. I said, well, then you can talk on my behalf as well if you want to. So I said, just say to them that I describe them as a couple of people that have a massive hernia and think that they're bigger humans than everybody else. It's a disease they've got, and they think they're they're on a better position. So they're they're inflated egos. Egos, exactly. Or, or, and, and victimhood, yeah. which is often what is associated with this, yeah. is actually a, a a a way of. It's an inversion of your your ego needs, isn't it? You know, you kind of what you do is you say, "I'm hurt. I'm the victim." But what you're really doing is like a kind of passive aggressive thing, isn't it? You're kind of saying, "But." I'm going to use this as a way of putting everybody else down. Um, and, and it, you know, yeah, you, it, it's the reaction. A similar uh, um, event occurrence happened when I was recording a podcast a few months ago uh, where there was a, 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 a actually, a, 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 I know a friend of yours who attended the event and was just talked at by this man in the most disrespectful way. And, my reaction at the time was I didn't intervene and I regret that because I don't feel I had the, I should have stopped the conversation and said, hang on, because I don't have the, the you know, I, th I think we look at, this is the, one of the challenges about maybe dogmatic bureaucrats. We look at the process and we look at, do you fill the form in right? And just ticking the form isn't inclusion and diver respect for diversity. It's those moments when somebody says, so, says something like that to you over a, which is completely inappropriate and disrespectful to anybody. And there's certain words that I don't like being used, which seem to be coming into the, the, the popular domain, which I don't like. Um, and it's, it's like kind of at what point do you, do you kind of say, do you be the person who jumps and says, hang on a minute, that's terrible you've got to put yourself you've got to switch so quickly and you've got to assert yourself it's almost as if we need assertiveness training in order for diversity and inclusion to be not policed by somebody else in the middle management hr department but to be something that is a a, a lived experience for people on the basis that it makes just practically works and makes things better for us without having to resort to well we need to call the the manager or we need to call the police or somebody like that to deal with this it's like it, it's dealt with between people but doing it also in a way with the caveat that the peace that you want to bring about is also your you know your, your own inner peace and also the you want to actually achieve something that moves that person on to be able to see that broader picture and to learn that i i, I i'm quite i don't mind people learning I don't mind people, you know, the, the language generationally, it changes. And, I, and some people have, their intent is not that to use that word. It, it, for them, it might not be as 
uh, offensive as we would regard it. However, things have moved on and things have changed. And do you bring about that change of understanding by admonishing people and confronting people sometimes? Do you bring it about by building careful, you know, you know, kind of a, a more careful kind of um, sense of trust that that it's okay to understand people from different communities, different cultures, different ethnicities. It's okay to learn how to engage with people in a respectful way, which is a word that you used earlier. But w w where do you get the chance to do that? So if we're only segregated in our towns that are segregated or our communities that are segregated if we unless we have invest in that common ground where we can meaningfully interact with one another and learn um we're, we're not going to get very far we're just going to hold on to our preconceptions that we get through the media which tell us about things right or wrong but as soon as we sit down with a group of people and have a conversation in the same room we suddenly realize that actually there are fewer barriers than we ever thought would be uh, available, ne needed. It's so true. I think um, when you were just talking about, um, you know, people having those strong ideas. Now, in that scenario, I bet, I mean, I don't know the situation, but I bet the individual that was being talked at was a younger person and the person talking yeah, away. Much older, yeah. I'll tell you who later. But <laughs> were they were they much older? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so my my um, optimism here is the fact that there's the middle people like yourself and me, <laughs> and then there's the younger people the that will not but, tolerate yeah. this. Yeah, but the older generation is phasing out, fading right. out. So hopefully, actually, maybe we don't need to do anything. Right. Maybe we just need to let people know that, look, the younger people can see that in front of them that it's not long ago that people had these strong, awful kind of attitudes. And also that it can happen. You know, we, we, we as human beings are so vulnerable to being becoming... Uh, well, we are a bit like sheep anyway. You know, we, we've accepted, like, just this whole thing about <clears throat> laughing gas uh, cylinders that's coming out at the moment. The Prime Minister's, um, you know, taking action on it. You know, at what point have we allowed society to become so accepting of these kind of downward spiral? that we don't, we now have to take action and, and people have a view on whether that should be a priority or not, you know, like that. You know, wh why is it that we have to ask for change, fundamental structural change to stop domestic violence? Why? It shouldn't happen. I mean, why we, does it we, require... We should be bringing about that change. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So at what, stage, at what stage was domestic violence acceptable and that now we need to change it you know what, what, how, why is it that we've got a, a, a faith system that allowed child abuse and not accept and, and was willing to put it under the carpet when the whole of faith is about the worst, the worst phrase that we can have in any society in any community is that it was an open secret and so many times people say, oh, yeah, you know, it's, it's, everybody thought something was dodgy going on, but nobody said anything. It's that lack of accepting, you know, because what we so often what we do is we defer responsibility to somebody else. Another body is there to sort it out and deal with it. And what we don't have is that responsibility ourselves to make sure that we're in an, an environment that cares and not just polices people's behavior so what I'm, we're going to finish off because uh I, I kind of i think we've covered some really great stuff and it's going to be great to listen back to this i was just going to say that the, you, you've given me a framework actually in terms of uh capture the testimony and this is how i think i can use this and apply this to community media so capture the testimony and stories of people of the advanced generation 
talk to the people of maybe our generation, as you say, in the middle, who are transitioning between that. But really important is talk to people of the younger generation to see how much more able they are and make sure that they are empowered not in a dogmatic way and not in a, re a reactive way but f just generally to be able to take a lead on social engagement social tolerance peace uh, uh, community cohesion and to do it in their way rather than being held back by saying well the elders and the community leaders leaders are telling us we should do it this way it's like well we really want to do it in a different way because we're two three generations in mm. or we will be at some point mm. and that seems to me to be a positive way of looking things yeah. in the future yeah and talking of that we've, we've um, just heard about um, <clears throat> peace and love festival that's happening I don't know if you know about it it's happening on the 8th of July and um, the organizer I've just been in touch with him um, just the kind of thing that Cos has been wanting to do for ages but he's already done it he's, he's doing it fantastic young person looking at how to bring about um, people together relating to the recent unrest in Leicester previously they'd worked on um, looking at anti-extremism and uh, in between they'd looked at uh, addressing knife crime so they've been doing it for a long time and what we're proposing from our perspective I think we can contribute towards that um, it's happening on the 8th of July at Humberston Gate well we'll provide the links um, is there anything else you want to add and how can people get in contact with you ok well uh, COS is looking for volunteers we are going to be continually looking for volunteers and we want to also bring about good opportunities for people to engage with us um, and yeah we've got huge plans we've got lofty ambitions I understand that but if you don't try you never achieve it <coughs> excuse me so if you do want to get in touch it's um, the email I don't know if that's very old fashioned now but right. email is celebrate our similarities at gmail.com it's quite straightforward the whole word without any dots celebrate our similarities at gmail.com and you're on LinkedIn yeah I'm on LinkedIn and we cause is also on LinkedIn um, if you want to get in touch with me on LinkedIn I, it seems to work better somehow LinkedIn doesn't allow you to use both and I'm sort of more myself than cause so <laughs> Um, so Kamla Patney that's K-A-M-L-A Patney P-A-T-T-N-I and I'll put all the links for this yeah. thank you very much for your time it's been wonderful thank you very much this has been I feel honoured that you should start with me thank you Rob thanks you've been listening to the Decentered Media Podcast with me Rob Watson to find out more go to decentered.co.uk or follow on Twitter and Instagram at Decentered Media.